You know, I'm a curious person. I especially enjoy watching other craftspeople, looking at how they approach planning, structure, and problems, and then bringing that knowledge back into my quilting. Today's guest, Kathy Hay, has a weakness for clothing of bygone eras. She loves to reverse engineer them so that they can, in her words, step out of the glass museum and live again. She's currently working on a very grand long-term project recreating the peacock dress. This dress was worn by Lady Corazon, the Vice Reign of India, at the Coronation Ball in 1902. It was designed by Worth in Paris with breathtaking beating by a team of Indian craftsmen in Delhi. Having just completed a long-term project myself, we are talking about these big projects, where they come from, how to manage them, and how to pivot when the project changes. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Kathy Hay. Thank you, Kathy, for being on the show today. It's just a delight to have you. You're on my wish list, and I'm so glad you said Yes. In my research I was uh, I was doing of you, I found out that you were a math teacher or you were studying education. Yeah, my bachelor's degree was mathematics and education. So I was all lined up to be a high school math teacher originally. So how did you make a detour into costuming? It was what I was doing when I wasn't at lectures. It literally started when I was in university. I all right, we don't really have our proms at uh, in British schools, or we didn't at the time while I was growing up, but we did have balls at university. So that was when I borrowed my mother's sewing machine and thought, I can't be that hard, can it? And it all started there. <laughs> as we all as as we all do. Yeah, sure, I can do that. No problem at all. <laughs> How hard can it be, right? How hard could it be? How many times have we said <laughs> that? How hard could it be? So was yeah. your mother a crafter? Or did she sew just because she made all your clothes? Uh, no, it was my mother is a knitter. Always has always been a knitter all her life, but never got into sewing. And before her, my grandmother was a big knitter, made all her dresses. It was grandma making dresses. My grandmother the other side. And my great grandmother is on the 1911 census as dressmakers. So it, it's come down through the family. So it's uh, it's all, you know, much of it you figure out as you go, but there are always little things that I learn. You know, at my mother's knee, I got me started and made it feel like it was possible. So it's all starts somewhere. So instead of going into mathematics and teaching, did you start your business right out of school or were you working for other people? Pretty much. I came, uh, as I went through university, making dresses myself for the formal events. Other people started asking me, can you make me one? Um, so that started in taking commissions. And it seemed like when I left university, um, I'm quite highly sensitive and a, a little bit anxious sometimes. So I found it difficult to be in high schools as an environment. I love teaching, but as an environment to work in, I found it very stressful. And as, as any teacher will tell you, you know, the working day, what will be a working day for any other person working in office is just a performance for a teacher. And there's all of the marking and the lesson planning and everything else goes on outside of normal school hours so I found it very stressful and wasn't it wasn't going to work for me so the thing I really loved to do was to sew so I started taking commissions and it seemed sensible that the one thing people are willing to pay for nowadays are wedding dresses so I started into making wedding dresses and specifically got interested in the history of dress and these beautiful dresses I would see in movies uh, in costume dramas and say okay I want to learn to make that so at about the same time, um, the law changed in the UK so that you could marry, not just in a church or in a registry office, but in various historic buildings. So I anticipated, well, there might be a trend of people wanting unusual dresses to match these unusual venues. So that was what I attempted to do. So, you know, after that 10 years of attempting to get something off the ground, making wedding dresses. So you've specialised in corsetry. Did that come out of the wedding dresses? Yes, a little bit, because it seemed like a lot of people were getting into corsetry around the early 2000s when I'd been in it for about five, getting on five, ten years-ish. Um, this There was this grand swell of um, interest in corsets and like getting that curvy shape. And how did, 
how did that work? And how do, how do you make that? There was a lot of talk of wedding dresses with sort of corset bodices, which really meant it just was laced down the back. It didn't actually do anything to your figure. So there was this great debate that started when I was getting online and groups forming around, okay, how do we figure out this corset thing? How did these work? And people were kind of fascinated by how you change the shape of your body. Did they really? Did they really lace them? Did it really change the shape? How, how does that work? So that was how I got into that. And, you know, as a mathematician, it's all about what's the solution? How can we figure this out? You know, that, that looking for the right answer. And it was a, it was a problem with a solution. So corsetry is often synonymous with female subjugation. What are some of your top myths about corsetry? <laughs> well, you're way ahead of me there. <laughs> yes. Um, corsets have been put together with the idea of the oppression of women in the past. And it's not necessarily quite such a strong correlation as people think. Because when we see a picture of a Victorian woman with this tiny, tiny waist, we look at that and think, good Lord, how, that must be painful. I can't imagine what that would be like to wear. And in fact, um, what we've discovered as we've been researching more and more over the years is that that shape wasn't just about the corset. That tiny, tiny, tiny waist wasn't actually tiny because Victorian women were masters of illusion because they were not only drawing in their waist a little bit, they were padding the bust and the hips like crazy. So optical illusion. So that was the fashionable shape, but they were willing to achieve it by, you might call cheating. Essentially, you use padding to make it happen. You use the hoop skirts to make it happen. The waist looks smaller because the fashion for the sleeves was huge and the hat was huge and the skirt was huge. So if everything else is huge, it makes the waist look smaller. So in fact, women weren't actually pulling those waists as tight as we think. It was kind of an extreme fashion. So there were people, there were fashionable women actresses or celebrities who might boast about their tiny waist and who might be, you know, tight lacing. But for the average woman, you had to still move around, work in domestic service. Um, you know, there were, you know, bring up children. You had to run a household. You had to do all of it. It wasn't like everybody was like sitting around on painting couches. We still had to get stuff done. You know, we still had lives. One of the one of the best demonstrations of this is there was um, a corset that was marketed as the pretty housemaid corset. So it was directly intended to be bought and worn by women who were working as domestic servants. So scraping out gutters, cooking, whatever they were doing, you know, highly active lifestyle. And they were wearing this corset. They just thought of it as a piece of underwear. It was what women wore before we started wearing bras. So the point was not about making your waist smaller. It was about supporting everything, supporting your bust, drawing your waist in a bit to support heavy skirts. Um, it was all just part of what they were at the time. If you start wearing those heavy skirts now, you discover that it's easier. If you've got a corset on, it just sort of distributes the weight of it better. Um, you think of it, it's easy to think of it like heels. If, we, if you can imagine a time in the future when everybody stopped wearing heels across the board, everybody wore flatties all the time, and we really got for the first time the torture that it does to our feet. Nobody ever did that again. Our daughters, granddaughters, great granddaughters would then look back at heels going, do you know, some of them wore five inch heels. And this sensationalist myth would develop about how we were all tottering about like Naomi Campbell on the runway, falling over on the runway, that would become the story around it. So yes, tight lacing happened for, for a lot of the time. For most women, it was, you were lacing it in like a snug belt because it was fashionable, but you were also padding. You can see the, the pads on the, on the mannequin there. That was fascinating in one of your recent blogs was that there was the ideal size, where now yeah. we're all dieting and exercising, trying to get the ideal measurements, they just padded it. <laughs> so ah. that's your ideal measurement. <laughs> so when you think about it, those courses and pads were 
possibly a better sort of thing. We don't want to have ideal body shapes and be aspiring to something we're not. But this was possibly a better idea than what we do now, because all we've done, we didn't take the corsets off. We internalized the corset and we made that our standard for what our body is supposed to look like. We don't wear those anymore. We go on diets instead and, you know, torture ourselves with trying to control our eating. Um, and while health is a good thing, taking that to extremes is not. So we've swapped one thing for another. So you got on my radar because of the peacock dress. Mm-hmm. When did you first see the peacock dress? It was 2006. It was a good 15 years ago now. Um, my then partner took me out to one of the National Trust properties. We have plenty of in Britain, not far from here, about 45 minutes from here. And right in the middle of one of their rooms, like downstairs in their basement, um, they were telling the story of um, Britain in British Raj, Britain in India. And in the middle of the room was this one glass case with this gentle glow and this incredible dress on a mannequin in the middle of it. It was like a scene out of a movie in this slightly darkened room with this this glass case with this glowing dress in the middle of it. Um, and just fell in love with it, fell in love with what it um, what it represented in terms of craftsmanship, because this was clearly, I mean, people would stand around the case going, I, I'm not sure I believe what I'm seeing. How long did it take to do this? How was this done? What is, just what, what? I've never seen anything like, because it, it's covered in embroidery, covered in gold and silver embroidery. And, but, and it would leave people breathless, which was the idea when it was made. But it was also a dress that, looking at it as somebody who knows a little bit about historic fashion, um, I could see that there were so many stories in that glass case that hadn't been told. Um, Kettleston Hall, where it is, is not a costume museum. It's not a fashion museum. They've just got this one dress that's part of the story of people who lived in that house. So they had some information but not a great deal. And there was an awful lot. I went away with more questions uh, than anybody because I was seeing, I don't know what I'm seeing here, but I think I'm seeing this. And how does that work? And what's the, there was clearly a hundred stories in that glass case that needed to be told. And nobody there seemed to really know, well, uh, uh, it was made in 1903 by the House of Worth and some Indian craftsmen, we don't really know who, unnamed Indian craftsmen. So there were so many unanswered questions and uh, it just wouldn't let me go. And had you done any deep historical research on any other gowns previous to this or this was a whole Um, new venture? Well, I'm not much of a historian or researcher as a maths teacher, so um, I do what I can. But previous to this dress, well, in fact, after I first saw this dress, I was getting interested in the House of Worth, which was the first haute couture label, the first designer label, uh, you know, Worth invented that concept. And I had the opportunity to study another dress that was worn by the same person in the same year and recreated that one first. So I had a dry run at it. Um, but I did start joking. Yeah, that guys, this is what I'm making next. And I was joking at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, that story developed. It's be careful what you say, because what you say creates your reality. So did you know anything about Lady Corazon before? Not really, before I visited that house. I, I lived in the area for a long time. So I'd seen, you know, there would be a Curzon Street and the name was clearly, went back a long way. It goes back a thousand years, I think, in that area. Um, I didn't know a lot about her. And I didn't know a lot about the story behind the dress. So that has been a whole unfolding um, story. Uh, All I knew was there was this fabulous ball uh, in India when Queen Victoria died and Edward VII came to the throne. Uh, India was at the time part of the British Empire. You know, we'd marched in and decided we, we owned India. And... Um, there was this big celebration of Edward VII coming to the throne where there was this huge ball and there was Lady Curzon in her fabulous peacock dress. Um, but her 
background, uh, she was vice reign of India, so she was this very high position, almost queen, vice reign, almost queen, but she was from Chicago. She was American. Um, and then you get into that story about uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there were um, many heiresses coming from America and marrying uh, aristocrats from Britain. She had the money, he had the title, and a crumbling stately home that was now going to be a couple of hundred years old and he didn't know where it was going to be the money. No, this story played out over and over that there would be, they, they were known as dollar princesses, uh, that the women would come bring the money and marry the English aristocrat. Um, and it sounds like marriages of convenience, but in this case, I believe from what we know, from what's been written about them, that they were actually a loving couple. They both seem to be extremely intelligent and <laughs> really applied it. When I dig into her history, she sounds like she, I mean, she was a woman of great privilege, but she used her intelligence for good, setting up those hospitals. And it sounded like the peacock dress and the embroidery, the Indian embroidery was something to promote India. Yeah. Like she was really, yeah. she bought into the whole yeah. <laughs> pride oh, of oh, India and their craftsmanship. Well, there was two sides to it, because on the one hand, they were at the level of the mindset they were in. They wanted to promote Indian craftsmanship. They wanted to um, patronize these craftsmen who were uh, had a skill that they'd been passing down from father to son for generations. Um, wonderful. And that was Queen Alexandra's coronation gown as well. She arranged for that to be done in India. Um, at the same time, it was also a little bit showing off look what we're in charge of you know there's there's very much two sides of it and part of the story with with this dress now for me has been it's gone a long way beyond what a pretty dress how was it done because it's opened up especially what we've all been through as a globally last year what's the real story here i had a 3 a.m moment when i woke up in the night and thought oh god and realized there's this whole other story that I've been conveniently avoiding about what were we really doing in India? What did this dress really symbolize? Because the peacock feathers, the peacock is a symbol of royalty in India. So this was a great big powerful flexing of muscles saying we're in charge, you know, and really when you start to read about India uh, and from the British in India from an Indian perspective, it was an occupation. You know, we were oppressing people. And we were stealing and just helping ourselves. So that's a difficult story to look at because on the one hand, it's very different values from what we want to, um, from how we want to live today and how we want to view each other today. And at the same time, you've got to look at it from the mindset of the time and say, well, in their own way, they were supporting craftsmanship at, at the level of the mindset they were working with. It's it's a tough story to unpack. There's a lot to it. And I'm sure in, you'll have many more episodes to do that. So you saw the peacock dress about 15 years ago. When did you actually jump on board committing to making it? So it was in 2011. Um, I had been saying for five years now, this dress just fascinates me. It won't let me go. Yeah, I'm making this one next, guys. Um, I got a chance to get involved with a charity competition in which uh, this was just after there was a, a big earthquake in Haiti in 2010, which just the news reverberated around the world and many people were, ended up living in tents and we saw the pictures on the news. Um, a year later, after the news cameras went home, uh, there was an effort um, by a small charity to help out to help in building um, a children's center. It was, it, it was this effort to try and help rebuild after the earthquake, um, led by Haitians, but this was an American charity wanting to help raise funds. And I got involved with them because they were starting a competition wherein the first 20 or so people to raise $5,000 would get to go to Haiti in person and help out and help 
build it in some way. I don't, I'm not a builder, but it seemed like it was a life-changing experience. So I, I had my own business. I don't have children. I'm the ideal, but you know, I'm young and strong. I'm the ideal person to do this. This is something it just, again, it was one of those things, ambitious project won't let me go. I think I have to do this. And when I started thinking about, and I, you know, I've got a blog, I've got a, a few people following me, I've got an audience, I could do this. So it soon, as, as the wheels turned as to how I'm going to raise $5,000, I remembered that when people raise a large amount of money for charity, they're usually doing something, some sort of challenge. They climb a mountain, they run a marathon. I thought, well, my followers also. So I need, hmm, I need a really ambitious project. And it dawned on me that <laughs> it's going to have to be the peak dress, isn't it? Because I've been joking about it for this long, that that would be perfect. It's a seemingly impossible project that nobody dares take on. And it will be an opportunity to look back into how was this really done? How was this, how was this incredibly incredible dress made? How was how did they collaborate between dressmakers in Paris and embroiderers in India with no email, no phones? It, it was the perfect opportunity to put those two things together. So you jumped on board. What was the first thing that you did? First thing I did was raise the money and go to Haiti. Um, in terms of making the dress. Uh, well, the first thing was I had to figure it out. I had to figure out how it was done. And I had to figure out, if you're going to make a dress, you need a pattern. So what was the pattern? What pattern am I going to use to cut out? And we all, you know, if you sew, you've bought, you know, the big four pattern companies sell these patterns of dresses. But I knew it couldn't be that simplistic. I really, really wanted to recreate it as it was. I really wanted to see it step out of the glass case and see it new. Because I was walking into that room, seeing people looking from around the glass case, going, oh, isn't it lovely? But I knew, looking at it as somebody who knows a bit about historic dress, saying, it's 100 years old. It's faded. It's tarnished. It's worn. It's been altered more than it looks like it has. I want to see it new. I want to see an actual pattern. So I had to find a pattern. And... Ten years later, actually, I'm still figuring out the pattern because it's a very old, very fragile dress. They're not going to get it out of the case for me. I did ask early on, and I was feel a bit foolish now because that was a stupid question. Because taking a, a very important historic dress off a mannequin and on and putting it on is going to damage it. So you want to do that as seldom as possible. They're not going to open the glass case for a bozo like me. So. Yeah, figuring out that pattern has been the ultimate maths problem. Did you sit down and think a bit through all the various steps or were you just working on the neck, the first problem and then you were starting with the next one? With this one, it's been so fiendishly difficult to figure out the pattern you can do that first step. That, I mean, other than that, there is, there is a sequence. There's certainly a sequence of steps in order to uh, make a pattern that fits. I have to have the underpinnings right because I've got to have all that padding and the corset and everything done in order to fit a pattern on top. Um, so there's been the case of making the underpinnings or what I need to get the shape right at least, um, to make a pattern, to mock up a pattern and how to make a muslin, and then to create a pattern on paper that the embroiderers in India can follow. And part of that process, of course, was finding an embroiderer in India who was willing to do it. Um, and it, it just, it's, a, it's been a very intimidating, intimidating thing to figure out. So it's really just figuring out what are the big pieces, what are the big rocks in this process, and then breaking it down from there. It, it's easier to talk about um, breaking down the process in terms of the dress I made first as a practice run, because that was an embroidery that I did myself. So there were... Uh, it was a dress covered in oak leaves and acorns. And I knew there were 420 um, leaves on the dress. I had a deadline for when I wanted to make it, when I wanted to wear it. So with three months and 420 leaves, and they're, they're all couched on in um, a, a sort of soutache cord and, and yarn, and it's, it, they're all couched on all over the dress in the shape of oak leaves. 
um, I just divided the amount of work I had to do by the amount of time I had. I knew it was a long process of 420 leaves. I knew if I did six leaves a day that I would make it on time. And it was six leaves a day, making sure it was five days a week, not seven days a week. So there was time of the weekend to catch up. So building in time for life getting in the way. And, you know, it really is a project planning process. Yeah. So I expect you have the same thing for your quilt. I actually used a timer because I found it was a process. There was at some point there was a process that did not lead to my strengths. The figuring out, the making it as complicated po as possible. I mean, that's just a joy yeah. <laughs> and indulgence. Yeah. But the the fiddliness of the paper piecing, there was a finite amount of time that I could do it. So I used a timer so I could just do one thing every single day and just know that eventually you'll get where you want to go if you can just take that one step at a time. So you were doing it in, was it half an hour increments, I think I heard in your video? Yes. And that's that's a great way to do it. If the whole thing intimidates you, it's just baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. And you just keep putting one point in front of the other. So I like that strategy. Actually, that's a that's a great way to look at it. You've got a lot of momentum behind you right at the moment. Since January, you've been doing, after 10 years, now yeah. you've got a lot of momentum going behind you. Yeah. There's been a lot that's gone in the way of this project, both, both, both the logistics of it holding me back or, you know, having obstacles and then something getting in the way or just the logistics of how to do it. Um, so it's, it's stalled for a long time. So I've created this way of holding myself accountable. But if I've got to release a video every month, then I've got to make pro progress because I've got to produce enough to make a nice video. So I'm, I'm, I'm having to fit that in with now having a business that has kind of taken over my life in the last year because it blew up during COVID, online education, everybody was interested. So I've now been uh, carving out particular days of the week so there are days when I work on the business and there are days when I work on the dress. So at the moment, Monday and Thursday. And Monday and Thursday are pretty much, um, you know, non-negotiable. Monday and Thursday I work on the dress and nothing else gets in. So it's, it's a similar way that those are my baby steps. It's days that I work on it. Do you do your own YouTube editing? I don't, not anymore. Since Christmas, I'm very fortunate to have a lady called Sophie Black helping me out, who is a filmmaker who lives locally. Um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily lucky. She's incredibly, incredibly skilled, talented. She's had a short film long listed for a BAFTA. So she's just incredible. And she's given me so much advice and help in how to film things, how to do the sound, um, how to do the lighting to just make it look a bit more professional a little bit. And it's just, with making videos, you'll, you'll know from doing YouTube yourself, it's all about getting a little bit better and a little bit better. And with each video, what can I do better next time? So yeah, I do have help now. Uh, and absolute respect to anybody who's editing their own because it's, that's a whole separate creative skill. Mm -hmm. And you know, as well as making the videos, filming the videos, you're also editing videos. You're, you're figuring out kind of marketing effectively because you're kind of trying to figure out what your audience wants and what will be interesting to them and then also planning it filming it it's a bit like what I said about teaching the performance when you're standing in front of the camera is hard enough to hit record and okay I'm not nervous it's fine um I'm getting comfortable being in front of the camera but that's only sort of one percent of it really isn't it yeah it is there's so, so much <laughs> between the planning and the the getting in front of the camera is almost the easiest part and the and the slow and the fastest <laughs> my advice is always that it's a long game you know maybe if you're young sexy and take off your clothes you can go viral in one day but the the rest of us it is a long game i think it's a long game for everybody you know even if you are young it takes a while and it's it's a skill it's a set of skills and if you can figure out and do your research and learn how to do it, like anything, like sewing, like quilting, if you're prepared to suck in the beginning, 
and just get a little bit better and a little bit better and figure out how to do it. If, you know, there's a, there's a method there. Have you ever felt that you've taken on too much? All the time! <laughs> it's a constant process of managing. Um, I mean, across my life, I've, I've recently taken on a new planner called the Monk Manual. And the principle behind it is you're planning, you're acting, and then you're reflecting on how it went and making plans based on your reflections. And it's really based on, well, if you think about it, monks get a heck of a lot done and they brew a lot of beer and grow a lot of vegetables and whatever it else there is that monks do these days. But by simplifying, I'm trying to learn that taking more on isn't necessarily going to be the best way to live or to do what I do. It's always about taking out the things that aren't essential, figuring out what's important and concentrating on the important things. But yeah, you uh, did you did you mean it in the context of taking on too big a project rather than too many things? It can be both. Like, have you ever looked at this dress and go, it's too much for one person? No, I didn't at the beginning. That came, that was a learning that came later because I did try to do it all on my own to start off with. I did think I could embroider the whole thing. Um, but I always looked at it as anything is possible. Somebody has made that dress before. If it's been done before, it can be done again. And there must be a way to make it possible. And that journey is not necessarily about getting the shiny dress at the end of it. It's about, I wonder who I would become on that journey as I figure out how to do the seemingly impossible or what's impossible for me. I'm sure there are professional makers who could knock out a peacock dress in a couple of months, but that's, that's, that's what's impossible for me. So it was, in a way, it was deliberate that I took on something that was seemingly impossible for me to see if I could figure out how to change my perception of what's possible, which has implications. I mean, what, what I discovered when I started working on it, when I started working on the previous dress, the opening dress, um, people would comment saying, if you can do that, I can finish my master's thesis. And that was, that was a big aha moment for me. And I, it, that was what, in a way, what made me take on the peacock dress, because I thought, it's got to be possible, nothing is impossible. And if I can do this, what does that make possible for anybody watching me do it? Can you see there being some big bumps in the road ahead? Like there's some other big learning curves that you've got to jump over before this dress is over? I'm looking forward to the obstacles that I can't see yet. That's, and that's part of taking one piece at a time. But I know that there are elements of this dress that I haven't even looked at yet that are going to be a whole project on their own. Like there's a bib across the front, a lace, I don't want to call it, but a bib is nice description, a piece of lace that is beaded with rhinestones and sequins in these sort of swirly patterns. I haven't even started looking at that yet. That's going to be a whole project in itself to figure that out, to figure out what I need, to figure out how to do it, what were the methods there. And again, I'm just thinking of it in terms of baby steps. You never, you, we underestimate what we can do in a year. We overestimate what we can do in a day and we underestimate what we can do in a year. So I enjoy having a journey that I can't see all on yet. But it's interesting looking at these long-term goals. Like I have a quilt that I'm working on that right from the very beginning, I did not put, I said it was going to be five years. But when you work backwards, you go, oh, okay, so if I'm going to get it done in five years, what do I have to have done this year so that it can be ready for then? This is probably why mine's taken me 10 years because I'm not as organized as you on that. <laughs> I've just been like, what's the next step? What's the next step? Because I'm so intimidated by the whole thing. And I've just been like, what's the next step? But yeah, you've got a better method than that than me then. From the beginning, did you have a, a concept of how long it was going to take? Did you know that this was going to be a multi-decade type of project? Uh, no, I had no idea. I thought I would do it in a year. Really? I'd made I made the oak leaf dress in six months. So I thought, well, this is clearly more work. It's going to be about a year. And what I've discovered from doing all the dresses I've made over the course of my life um, 
is that things always take longer than you think they will. Mm. The more ambitious it is, the longer it is going to take. So I have learned not to make a fool of myself by trying to call how long it's going to take. It just it's going to take as long as it's going to take. And I'm, um, I'm finding that an empowering message to send because we live in a culture now that wants the big reveal in this video. It doesn't, we, 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 a truism among costume, which is costume makers who are on YouTube, is that you have to make a video in which you go from design to reveal in one video. And people are burning themselves out trying to do that. Mm. And the viewers are getting the impression that it's easy when it's not. And they'll have a go and think, oh, what's wrong with me? But it's hard. So I think there's a value in things taking a ridiculously long time because I'm normalising things just take time. It's going to take as long as it's going to take. Um, and I like opening that door, even though it frustrates people. <laughs> so your dress was made in... The original, the original peacock dress was made uh, in 1901. Are you embracing the technologies that they had at the time or are you using whatever you have available? I am doing my best to get, I like to try and get the experience of what it would have been like at the time. So um, while I'm not the kind of costumer who will sort of raise the sheep, shear the sheep, weave the wool and go to that extent, I have bought uh, an antique sewing machine, which you can see behind me. Mm -hmm. um, about the right date, um, not perfectly the right date, but it's enough to get the experience maybe a couple of years out, but I'm not going to split hairs. Um, and certainly the methods, because I'm going to embroiders in India, as the original would have been done by, would have been done in India by these skilled craftsmen. Um, so yeah, I'm doing, I'm really doing my best to, to recreate the experience as best I can and try not to use too many modern conveniences. Well, my next question was, does the computer help at all? The computer helps a lot with peering at photos <laughs> for, for a lot of the time. Um, I don't tend to use my computer for like, app making, that kind of thing. I like the pencil and paper process. Um, you know, I'm a mathematician, so I've got no particular need to um, shorten that process because I enjoy the geometry. Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoy the drawing of diagrams and so much of my work within my business is on the computer I'm kind of looking for opportunities to get off the computer and just be grounded and um, enjoy how the process of creation keeps you present and away from technology so at the same time I'll use centimetres not inches some of the time because it's just who wants to figure out an eighth of two inches? You know, well, an eighth of two inches is easy, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I know what you mean. I live in a country that lives in two different systems as well. Yeah. So I always say I'm bilingual. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I switch back and forth between the two. So when it's when it's convenient, although I suppose in France in 1902 they would have been using centimeters. So, but I, I don't split hairs too much, but I am trying to capture some of the magic of what it would have been like. How have the events of the last two years changed the way you're doing things? That's a big question. I remember the first time I made a video about this project, you can, I could see myself saying, well, you know, Britain and India is, well, you know, it's, we don't talk about that. We're talking about a dress. Let's look at the fabulous dress. Let's look at the beautiful work of craftsmanship. Um, and I realized over the last couple of years, and last year in particular, I don't get to do that. Um, we've gone through, we are going through a process in the historical costume community, historical dress community, where we've started to look at this and say, oh, we can't just romanticize the past and make the pretty dress and wear the pretty dress. We've got to talk about history. We've got to talk about um, how history is in the past, it's a long time ago, but it affects the present. It affects who we've become in the present. The sort of internalized biases we've got have been handed down from that history. So we have to look more closely at what the clothes we're making represent. 
So this dress is the absolute epitome of that because it was symbolic of the British occupation of India. The reason that the dress was made was for a ball at which Mary Curzon was supposed to be just the symbol of, you know, the splendor of India as occupied by Britain. So we have to start talking about those stories and really repairing the stories. Um, I know that the uh, that Kettleston Hall and various historic houses around the country and the organisations responsible for those historic houses are having to look at these histories again and start telling the story from more different perspectives. You get a much better perspective on the truth when you tell different facets from different people's perspectives. So what I've been doing is looking more closely and learning about the history of Britain and India from the Indian perspective um, and learning about how they use some very different words and some very different stories and tell a very different story. So it's important to look at everybody's perspective and then be able to look at this dress and say, is there another way of looking at this? One of the things that I've not been comfortable about it or I'm not comfortable, I've, I've become not comfortable with as I've noticed it, is that we talk about the beautiful peacock dress by the House of Worth, which is the fresh French fashion house was responsible for it. But it was created by the House of Worth and unnamed Indian craftsmen. Whereas, in fact, we actually know the name of the people who made it. There was a sketch in an, a magazine the week after the ball that you can still find with pictures of the men working on it. And you can see the sign in the window saying Kishan Chand. And it was, a, it was a workshop in Delhi. So I want to start telling that story and writing India back into that story. And it's really by talking about the beautiful dress, you open a door into talking about Britain and India um, and starting to unpack some, some really uncomfortable stories that we haven't faced yet. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an opportunity for art to help in this process of repairing stories and repairing the way we look at ourselves and work, the way we look at our past and the way that we look at who we are today and how we all have, what sort of a society we want to be today. You know, it, it, it all connects, it all connects up. Well, I am certainly looking forward to learning more about this history, <laughs> what you find. I know I'm going to be digging a little bit deeper into it, but Thank you so much for being on the show today. If people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? Oh, there are lots of places to find me. Um, I'm on Instagram as Kathy.hay. I'm on YouTube under Kathy Hay again. And if you want to sign up to my mailing list, I send out uh, what I call a love letter every week to just sort of support your creativity because we have such a hard time making space in our lives to be creative. We think of it as the last thing on the to-do list, but we'll do that. That's just a selfish thing we do after all the, the essential stuff is done. So I really like to support people's journey. So if you go to the website foundationsrevealed.com, which is my sewing school, you can sign up for a free account there where you, you get onto the mailing list and you can get those love letters. And that will give you reminders about my videos as well. Again, well, thank you so much for being on the show. I hope to see more of you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for having me, Karen. It's been wonderful. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Kathy Hay. If you haven't Googled the peacock dress yet, I'll leave some links in the notes below. I will also leave Kathy's social media, her YouTube channel, and her website links as well. I am definitely looking forward to seeing future updates on this and her other projects. And as you're working through your next project, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background while you sew. I have interviewed many amazing people on this series. Let one inspire you. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is John from the Art East Quilting Company. It was his pet portrait class that triggered my acquisition of Mando, my new dog. And we will be talking about animal blocks and his pet portrait class. You don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Last week, I uploaded my video, Sewing on the Go. This is all about making a small sewing kit so that wherever you go, you can always work on something. So if you haven't watched it yet, I'll leave a link in the notes to that as well. 
If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, my website at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care and I'll see you next time.